and welcome to the Gold Outlook 2023 panel. I'm your moderator, Daniel Berenkin, founder and CEO at Six. Our mission is to unlock social mobility on a global scale by empowering anyone from anywhere to invest in anything. And so in pursuit of that aim, I invite you to submit any questions that you have related to our theme, and I'll do my best to work your ideas into our panel discussion. To kick things off, let's begin by introducing our guests, starting with largest to smallest by market cap. So Rick, who is on uh, the microphone presently, the floor is yours for a brief introduction. Uh, thanks, Daniel, and good morning, everybody. Uh, Contango is developing a nice high-grade gold deposit in Alaska in joint venture with uh, Kinross. And uh, the unique thing about our company is we're not building a mill and a tailings facility. We're simply transporting the high-grade ore up to the Fort Knox mill uh, by truck. And so we we basically are able to get our deposit quickly into production and uh, with a very <coughs> simple execution plan and on obviously fairly low capital since we're not building the mill and tailings facility. So we'll be in production in 2024 and um, producing about 67,000 ounces of gold a year. Uh, should be cash flowing, free cash flowing at $1,800 gold, about $40 million a year. So we're, uh, we're pretty advanced story and quickly becoming a producer. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction. And Neil, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining um, today's panel. <clears throat> Step Gold is a, a gold and silver producer today, currently producing from our phase one operation. It's an oxide mine, uh, straightforward heat bleach uh, that we brought production online in April 2020. So during COVID with 100% local team, uh, we commenced commercial production, profitable production, and we are now expanding over the next two years into our sulfides. So we're going to grow from a kind of 40 to 50,000 ounce producer today at about $850 of all in cost to over 100,000 ounces uh, at current mine life of 12 years that we just uh, announced an update last week. So we're doubling our production profile uh, over the next two years while continuing to expand through drilling, uh, not only on this mining license that's only been drilled down to about 350, 400 meters, but also on our very large exploration license we hold in the southwest of the country. So a uh, pretty action-packed story with production, proven uh, track record of building a, a mine very quickly and cheaply and profitably, obviously, today, uh, and expanding that into a, a larger-scale project that has some has some legs, I guess. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Neil. David, over to you. Thanks. Great to be here. Uh, White Gold Corp, it's, uh, we're, it's a pretty unique uh, exploration company. We're based in Canada's Yukon. Uh, we have an extremely large portfolio of uh, early stage grassroots properties, which has uh, successfully grown uh, into a, a significant gold deposit. The, the properties are all located in what's known as the White Gold District or the Klondike District. This is was the epicenter of the infamous gold rush at the late uh, 1800s. Uh, and remarkably, there's been over 20 million ounces of gold found in placer mining right from the surface, but there really hasn't been any modern day exploration until about 15 years ago. This is when our partner, Sean Ryan, entered the district and started to use some very novel uh, uh, approaches to try and find uh, the source of this mineralization. What's unique is it's not glaciated there, so there's really very limited outcrops. You had to kind of bring a different approach than your traditional Canadian prospecting. And he was able to sort of dial in uh, soil geochemistry as an indicator and remarkably within a couple of years of uh, applying this technique he, 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 he his work led to two major multi-million ounce discoveries uh, one being the golden saddle deposit which uh, we now own is actually acquired by Kinross uh, for 140 million dollars they've combined that with our company and our partner of ours the other it was the coffee deposit which was acquired by uh, gold Corp for 500 plus million dollars, which is now owned by Newmont and being advanced into production. So this is an area of the world, it's a great jurisdiction with a huge land package, such prolific history, hardly no work's been done, the little bit of work that has been done, uh, it's brought, you know, incredible success. And I think it's now finally really come onto the global uh, radar in terms of an emerging district. Uh, as I mentioned, Newmont is in there, Kinross is our partner, Agnico Eagle is also our 20% partner. Uh, we partnered with them right at the very beginning. Uh, we see Rio as a partner of uh, Casino Deposit, which is owned by Western Copper and Gold. That's a huge multi multi million copper gold porphyry. And, you know, it's at the very early stages of an emerging district. We really think we've sort of cracked the code as to, um, you know, how to find these deposits. 
our own resources are either bumping on two million ounces or two grand, which is pretty uh, unique for a junior at this stage. And we think we're, you know, just scratching the surface and hopefully we'll be able to make many, many more of these. And we've had some great discoveries by Newmont's property on our Betty, super high grade gold from the surface. So it's an exciting place to work and exciting time to be working with. Very cool. Uh, Wes, over to you. Uh, thanks, Daniel, and thanks everybody for joining us today. So uh, Thunder Gold is, uh, we own and operate the Tower Mountain Project in uh, northwestern Ontario, just a few kilometers outside of the city of Thunder Bay. We have a number of uh, strategic benefits, uh, including existing infrastructure that's in place. We're, we're immediately beside the Trans-Canada Highway. Our work to date on the project indicates that this is a potential magmatic hydrotherm hydrothermal gold deposit. And uh, that's a, a somewhat different uh, uh, target than, than what Archean Greenstone belts are famous for, which are, are more of the orogenic uh, uh, load gold type deposits with uh, super high grades. This is a very large tonnage, low grade opportunity. Uh, gold grades are probably going to average somewhere between 0.8 and 1.2 grams per ton. But the good news is there's going to be a lot of tons, which equates a lot of ounces. So I'm looking at this as an opportunity to get in early on, a, on an undervalued junior company. That's one of the attractions that uh, brought me to the story. And I'm looking forward to advancing the project at, uh, uh, at a rapid pace and developing some, uh, some value for our shareholders. Very cool. And Jim, over to you for an introduction. Well, I guess we're last. That means we're the smallest. But I would say that gives us the largest amount of potential. So I'll just quickly talk about the company. We have a gold. We're mainly focused on gold, of course. That's why we're here. We have two major gold projects that we're working on, one in the Kirkland Lake area where we're drilling off high-grade uh, quartz veins, which we uh, had a past producer on you know, a small <clears throat> mine in the past, has a small resource. Our other major project, which we're a little more excited about, is what we call our Hemlo project in the Batchewana Greenstone Belt. And that is a, a Hemlo lookalike um, that's been called a Hemlo lookalike by one of the guys that discovered Hemlo. So I kind of rely on his opinion as to the thing, as to the project. On that project, we have at least four high-grade intersections from the past that have not been followed up. <clears throat> that project was explored from the late uh, 80s to the early 90s and sort of uh, very appropriate for what we're talking about was that the reason it was abandoned in the early 90s was because the price of gold went to $350. And I think that's one of the things that we now have the opportunity to take advantage of some of these dips in gold price, uh, you know, which caused some projects to be abandoned, including both of the projects that we're working on in the Kirkland Lake area and in the Batchewana area. That's it. <laughs> Incredible. Well, thank you for the introduction and the introductions. What's really interesting about the panels that we have here today is the unique perspective and views and connection to gold itself. And it's been said before that there are weeks where decades happen and decades where weeks happen. And what's really interesting to me is that over the last three years, we've seen significant volatility in pretty much all aspects of the macroeconomic environment and all aspects of the gold environment. We've seen gold's volatility move from a lows of 1400s to highs of 2050. We've seen interest rates reach new, new, new levels. And so the question that I have to the panelists is, in this environment, has gold done what it was supposed to do? Well, I'll take a first crack at it just to get the ball rolling, maybe. Um, I actually believe it has. Uh, so back in 2020, you know, obviously February, March was the beginning of this three-year run of COVID, I guess. Um, uh, gold came down with every other asset class. It's liquid, very liquid. It's the most liquid you know, currency uh, in the world, I think, right? So um, it sold down, but it, it, it was the first to recover and hit all, all time highs. So, you know, everything had to get sell, sold stocks, uh, um, hard assets, and whatnot. And, and, and it hit all time highs in, in a very tough time. You know, the fundamentals for gold were already strong going into the beginning of COVID with. You know, nothing's changed in terms of debt and what's going on in the world. It's only gotten worse. We've had now wars. So I think gold actually, um, compared to other asset classes, has performed as it should. I mean, a lot of people want it to be higher. That's great. It will come, I believe. But certainly where it is today versus other asset classes, I think it's still the best performing asset class. And it did 
hold this value, um, the majority of its value uh, versus others. Yeah, I would agree with that. And maybe just add, you know, people are looking at gold generally in U.S. dollar terms because that's what it's it's quoted in, right? So maybe people, you know, we're in all, you know, decades high inflation. There's geopolitical uncertainty. But if you look at the price of gold in pretty much every currency other than the U.S. dollar, it's, you know, at its all-time highs. And it's like, then it's really reflecting, it's acting as it should have as a hedge against inflation and, and um a safe haven type asset. So I think that's uh, something, you know, perspective people should remember. And I think the other thing that you should remember is very important. Maybe we'll talk about this later. You know, gold is a financial instrument being priced in U.S. dollars with interest rates as high as they are and U.S. dollars as strong as it is. And, it, and the price of gold being where it is in that environment is actually, you know, my uh, very bullish, right? Because at some point in time, you know, these interest rates are cyclical. They, they, you know, they're going to pause, they're going to go down. I don't know when that's going to be. People have different views. But when that's going to happen, the dollar comes down, price of gold is going to now increase in U.S. dollar terms. So if we're, if that starts happening from a base of $1,800, you know, I think the re-rating potential here is going to be, you know, through its all-time high and significantly higher than that on that element alone. Yeah, I just say that I've been looking for gold since Nixon took took the gold standard off. So as West probably has as well. So we've seen a few things. So when somebody says to me, "Is gold behaving as it should?" It's been going up for fifty years. So it's pretty hard to say it's not going to keep going up. But I would say one thing: since two thousand to two thousand and twenty, gold basically traded in a let's call it a channel between 1700, 19, that kind of channel. Now, that has two different aspects. First of all, if you're doing a feasibility study, that's great because one of the challenges you have when you do a feasibility study for gold is trying to figure out what the gold price is gonna be in 10 years when your mine is operating. Now, the second thing that's bad about that is if you're trying to raise money, of course, you want the price to go up. So as far as behaving as it should, I think it really depends on on what you want to do. If you want to raise money, you want it to go up. If you want to put a mine in production, you probably want it to stay fairly high, but fairly consistent. I think it really has to do with what I call, um, let's call it, uh, I don't know, what people think. For instance, I tell everybody when gold goes from, let's say $1,700 to $1,800, everybody gets excited. When it goes from $1,900 down to $1,800, everybody gets sad. It's the same bloody price. But it has to do with momentum. And I think that's really what we're seeing right now. We're starting to see a little momentum. And that will certainly help, hopefully, get us out of this channel we've been in for quite a while and help help juniors raise money. Because as we know, when the price of gold is going up, it just makes it easier for juniors to raise money. So that's where I'd like to see it go. Yeah, I'll just uh, jump in, just take maybe a bit broader view. I mean, this last three years it's about money printing related to covid but the money printing in in a big way started back in 2008 with the world financial crisis and if you look back and uh, at the gold price uh we went from a 600 hundred dollar gold price pre-2008 to about a 1200 dollar gold price uh post we went up all the way up to 2000 but it, it settled back down around 1200 so because of the money, money printing and in the inflation that caused, gold doubled. And then from uh, from 2012 to today, again, uh, we're, we're about 1,800. We're being pretty stable at about 1,800 uh, for about three years now. And uh, uh, that that is related, in my opinion, to the money printing that came as a result of COVID. So if you, you kind of just look at the big, broad strokes, Gold's done exactly what it's supposed to do. It's it's reacted to the inflationary pressures of money printing. Um, and the question is, are we done printing money, or uh, are we uh, are we going to be stable for a while? Well, I think when you're looking at driver, and I don't, you know, I don't want to disagree, but during the again the period from 2000 to 2020, the, the inflation was pretty constant. It came down after 2020. 2020, but stayed pretty consistent. And in fact, went down a bit, but the price of gold still went up. So I'm having a little trouble relating, you know, gold to inflation on, on that basis, just on a long-term basis. And I understand that the past is no predictor of the future, but, you know, I, I, I just tend to look at those kind of trends to see what, what, what I think might happen going forward. 
Well, I, I would uh, say that if you just look at the charts, when the money printing started in 2008, yeah. it's pretty clear uh, when you print trillions of dollars, and it's not just the United States printing dollars, remember, it's, it's other countries printing other currencies. Uh, that's, in my opinion, that's where the inflation is coming from, and that's what gold is reacting to in a very predictable way. As a safe haven asset and as a risk-off asset, we're seeing record inflows into groups purchasing gold itself. We're seeing central banks purchasing gold at the most aggressive rates and the most aggressive pace. We're seeing institutional poor capital into gold. What is your view about ultimately how gold will discover its price, how that price discovery mechanism will ultimately unfold and what the price of gold ultimately will be two, three, four, five years out? I'll, I'll jump in here again, just saying that uh, I think right now there's two big events going on that are having an effect on gold. And we're talking about pricing in U.S. dollars here. Uh, the Fed and what, what's it, what it's done in the last year. We've gone from near zero interest uh, cost of capital to 5% risk-free cost of capital in one year. Uh, the market, the general market, hasn't adopted or adapted to that huge change in the cost of capital. Um, people who loan money at near zero are basically, you know, losing, losing out on, uh, you know, getting very low returns on that money in an environment where we now have a five percent risk-free cost of capital. So uh, that reset, in my opinion, is going to take place at some point in time. Uh, that I think. I think the Fed's going to run out of bullets. It can't just keep in, increasing uh, uh, the risk-free rate. And when I don't think there'll be a Fed uh, a Fed pivot to lower lowering interest rates because they've been they've been signaling stronger for longer. So higher interest rates for longer. They don't want to create a huge worldwide recession. Uh, so I think the the pause, the Fed pause, will be will be the pivot and. And gold will move on that on that uh, uh, on that pause. I know it's difficult to predict where it's going to go, but I would, and I hate to recommend somebody, but I would recommend that people take a look at a group called CMP Commodity Analysts. So they've been analyzing commodities, including gold and silver, for like fifty years. And each year at the beginning of the year, they put out a gold and so all metal actually but especially a gold and silver uh idea about where they think it's going based on their ideas and they've been they've been pretty good and so i i tend to read them i maybe i believe them or not but it's some it's a group that i read and have some pretty good ideas about where gold uh, is going to go yeah i think daniel daniel touched on the fact that the central banks have increased their purchases of gold and, and that's an interesting development that you like to see but you know, one of the things that always catches my eye is the fact that gold has been, you know, a, a steady state performer for, you know, certainly the last 10 years, if not longer. And, and what you're seeing is you're not seeing a significant increase in, uh, you know, more people purchasing jewelry or more people purchasing um, gold for, for investment purposes. These these are sort of steady state with a slight, just a slight increase year on year. So. You know, we're currently we currently see production of about 120 million ounces of gold a year globally, and and um, uh, demand of about 150 million ounces of gold a year annually, and and that to me signals that there's a lot of people out there that perhaps maybe not Western focused uh, society is is still bullish on gold, but I think a lot of uh, a lot of the emerging economies around the world are are very interested in uh, putting some money towards gold for the future and and. Uh, building some wealth that way. Yep, I agree with that. Definitely uh, Eastern culture hasn't changed in thousands of years. It's, it's, yeah. it's, in our, it's in our culture and you're seeing that. So Indians, Chinese have never stopped buying gold and always believed in it, um, even through all this volatility in the world. So that hasn't that hasn't changed and, and will continue. And those populations are continuing to grow and they're less indebted, I would say, than many other Western jurisdictions yes. in the world. So. Uh, they have an opportunity to to really uh, you know increase their wealth this way. That, that's an excellent point. Actually, yeah. the, the the indebtedness is just not there, and and their middle class is growing at a faster rate than the middle class in uh, in Western society. So right, yeah. 
for savvy investors building out their portfolio strategy, how should they think about gold as a hard asset that's generally viewed as risk off relative to junior mining equities, which are a speculative asset? Well, I guess you should, you should probably have a bit of both, uh, whatever weighting you choose your own. But, um, you know, if you want this slow and steadier approach, obviously buy the physical and that should be a, depending on your risk profile and your, and your wealth uh, and your portfolio, then you should have a certain percentage there. And clearly gold can go up 50 and 100 percent. We've already seen it over a decade or two. Right. Um, so you still have some pretty good upside there uh, by owning the physical. Uh, but obviously, we know in, in the junior space, you, you, you're not going to get, you know, a 10, 20 bag out of gold this, as quickly as you can from owning a junior that has that leverage in a, in a strong market, um, leverage to the gold price and to M&A and all that jazz. So uh, I would just look for a, a good weighting of both. Uh, you know, those who move to production obviously have uh, excitement. Those who can explore and, and be sold at 10, 20 times their valuation in short order. Um, you probably want that exposure too, because then you can then convert that into more physical, conservative uh, portfolio, I guess. Yeah, that's exactly the way I, I would sort of view it as well. You know, the, the equities, especially the junior equities, is leveraged to the gold price. Um, like the reality is, junior equities, all of them, not, not only junior mining, you know, they're viewed as speculative assets. So, now we're saying the fact that the commodity prices continue to hold in or perform very well, you know, I think we. Everyone on this call probably is, <laughs> is well aware that you know the equities have done the exact opposite. But that's because they're more viewed as a risk asset, like a tech asset. They kind of follow that path. And actually, I think it's currently it's the largest disconnect ever between the equity values and the values of the underlying commodity, which, from my perspective, is setting up you know a very nice entry point for a, a major re-rating. Right. Once the risk sentiment comes a little bit back on, you know that'll dovetail with gold prices going up because interest rates will be uh, flat or, or coming down. And then I think you're really going to see a catch up play. You know, this is kind of the time as an investor where you want to be looking for these quality type assets that are either trading at these historic discounts where you can start building a little bit of a position, right? You know, it, I think one thing that we're all sort of seeing is there's not a lot of FOMO in the market in the junior mining side right now. Everything's sort of facing or kind of coming down, but it historically, when it turns, it turns quickly, right? So when you get in, it's hard to say, but I think most investment strategies, as you start to build these positions slowly over time, you want to be prepared ahead of the sort of the, the crowd to take advantage of the opportunity. I think we're, we're in that exact position now. Because like I can remember said, interest rates can't go up forever here. You know, I think we're closer to the end than we are at the beginning. So this could sort of be a very timely opportunity to start doing it. Yeah, the, uh, I, I just comment that the, uh, the gold commodity price and the gold equity price is really disconnected starting back in 2008 again with this inflationary pressure that came uh, as a result of printing money and we haven't stopped printing money we, we've had uh, various reasons for uh, printing money and the disconnect in my opinion is is infl is related again to inflation that the, the fact that gold mining companies haven't actually made any more profits at the higher gold prices because the cost of producing your gold, so gold goes up. And if you look at if you look at the overall trends and the overall stats, that's basically what they're showing. Uh, and that's something that the, I think the gold industry has to wrestle with. And that's that's why I think free cash flow is uh, is an important metric in, in being in the gold uh, gold mining business. And as far as the explorers go, the fact that I think investors are disappointed in general because gold producing companies aren't more profitable at the higher prices. Uh, and that's an unfortunate fact. And unfortunately for junior explorers, they are they are discounted to their potential nav of the projects that they're they're exploring for, and and, and in some cases finding and defining resources. But they traded a discount to that, uh, and then lately that discount has been a very high discount. Uh, I would totally agree with with what David said that I think there is a pivot going to happen here because, meanwhile, you've got. The major companies producing less gold um, and the demand for gold has not waned. It's in fact, it's increasing. Central banks are buying gold. You've got this nexus of Russia, China, India and Iran uh, against the U.S. dollar, the U.S. dollar hegemony. So that that's a big trend and that's not going to happen overnight. That's that change to an alternative 
world currency not, is not going to happen overnight, but it is a trend. Um, so I think those are the big dynamics that are going on with respect to gold, the commodity, and, and the uh, gold uh, equities, in particular the junior explorers that are always traded at a, a huge discount to their potential net. On the discounts that many companies in the gold equity space are experiencing, we didn't have submitted a comment, which I think probably expresses the sentiment that a lot of gold investors are feeling, which is that many gold companies that you follow, that they follow are hitting their 52-week lows now. When the sector should be turning around, is this finally the actual bottom, or is there more pain to fall? Mm -hmm. I wish I had the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> You can't really predict the bottom, I guess. I mean, yes, we're somewhere near it, but um, listen, there has been the financing windows opened up again in the last little while. Uh, how long will that last? Uh, if it doesn't last long, uh, you know, there's still still some carnage in the world that's happening. Uh, you've seen all these layoffs uh, in North America included and, and whatnot. So I don't know if we're seeing the exact bottom, but we're certainly getting close. We're maybe still one or two quarters away. Uh, you know, a lot of these companies never got funded last year or the year before. Um, they're, they're going to remain at 52 week lows until they get funded, uh, and then it can 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 create news flow and, 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 and all that. So I think there's a lot there's a large overhang for a lot of unfunded companies that had a delay because they couldn't get access to the capital. Uh, it wasn't there, uh, or, or very small windows, and some have seen that. Right, and that's where you've seen uh, M and A happen at some of these uh, smaller guys at 52 week lows too. You know, it's, 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 you're supposed to see that you're supposed to believe that you don't need a massive premium to create a win through a merge. Right. And that you'll, you'll catch it up later together as a re-rate. So, uh, so I think it's a combination of that kind of stuff. I think when we start to see, we know when we're close to the bottom, when we start to see more of the generalist funds and the generalist investors come in, because they'll take a look at the valuations and that's what they invest on. And that, I think that's when we'll be able to sort of say, well, we must be very close to a bottom if those guys are starting to see value in, in you know, the generalist investors. I'm not talking about the people that invest in junior mining or mining companies all the time. But, you know, right now there's a lot of money around that can't be deployed. You know, cannabis is no good. Bitcoin is no good. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's that's really been very painful for investors and so i think when they start to come back into the mining space uh that's when we'll know we're close to a bottom because they they can pick them yeah that, that's a good point i think that's starting right it doesn't happen overnight they do their homework they kick some tires and you know i have perfect examples out at the vancouver resource conference a few weeks ago and you know mm -hmm. bunch of the guys there that you know, haven't bought a mining stock in five years, right? So, you know, I'm talking to a bunch of other investors that companies that are out there and they're, they're getting the meetings, whereas a couple of years ago, they couldn't get the meeting. Right now, they're getting the meeting. People are doing their homework. And uh, like you said, from just a pure financial perspective, looking at historic valuations, it's, it's, it's starting to look very attractive to them. So I think that's certainly starting. I think the M&A should also start to bring a little bit of excitement back in, right? These are opportunities make 30 50 percent uh, type uh increases sort of in a very short period of time we're starting to see those sort of premiums coming back into the market you know from the majors perspective these assets have never been cheaper ever right so you know they're depressed too but not at the same multiple that some of these juniors are depressed with a lot of great assets out there so we're gonna see that starting to pick up um you know and at the end of the day i think what drives it the most is you know, notwithstanding the disconnect we were talking about earlier, is the price of gold. If we can start to see a little bit of traction momentum with the price of gold, like we saw in January, that just builds excitement. That brings the generalist investor into it. You know, I think that two thousand uh, dollar is, is a mental milestone. That's when you start getting back into the media and CNBC and all that kind of stuff. And it's flows of capital, right? This it's a very small pool of capital in the venture space. To the extent any capital starts to come in, it has a big re-rating potential and you know, it will all start to think, happen uh, very quickly once it does. Yeah, I would agree with, with David that uh, I think $2,000 gold is, uh, is a magic number for investors, whether it's just psychological or whatever. It's, uh, uh, I, think, I think that'll be a, a defining moment. Um, I don't know when that'll happen, obviously. I wish, it, you know, wish I had the crystal ball, but it, you know, we've been pretty stable here at $1,800. Uh, and uh, 
I think that's that's going to provide a great opportunity for M and A because uh, when it moves, it's going to probably move quickly. I think we we mentioned that before, um, and you know, for companies like ourselves who are are trading at a a good valuation and we, we we've done very well, we're not trading at a discount to our NAV. We're trading at a premium to our NAV. So. You know, we'll be looking in the M and A space for those kind of opportunities. I, I think that'll be an exciting time in the business because that's what the junior exploration business is is all about: finding good quality assets and then uh, and then having putting together ideas, putting together companies that then one plus one is three. That's the that's the real that's the real big story I think for the the next phase of uh, the junior exploration business. Yeah, I think that uh, that sort of supercharges everything that's uh, that's related to the overall movement in the gold prices, the M and A activity, and we're starting to see it with the majors now, and and typically that filters down to the intermediate producers, and they start to to do acquisitions and mergers with other companies to build the to build a better value creation opportunity and vehicle, and and uh, it just keeps trickling down to to the junior sector, and you see a number of. Uh, uh, good projects by our, that are assembled with good teams, and, and uh, those are the opportunities in the space. So Jim West, you mentioned that you've been in the sector, in the space, since the Nixon era. And the question I have for you is... You've seen Why am I still doing it? <laughs> <laughs> you've seen a few cycles where the euphoria takes off, and it can happen quickly. What are some of the memories that you have of those cycles? And the question I have for you is, at what point in that cycle, do you realize this is real? This is happening. Like what most of the, well, oftentimes the cycles start because of some kind of discovery. Like one of the things that happens in this business is that it doesn't matter where somebody discovers something, as long as there's some discovery happening, that seems to affect the whole thing. I mean, I remember when gold price went from $35 to $100, we thought we were gonna be fabulously rich. But that was because of the fact that there was an overhanging amount of, of, of potential there. And I think every time we've seen a major spike, it's, it's been because of, of, uh, of potential. Like people see momentum in the price. Okay, there's some momentum. doesn't matter where it's from to. Let's say it's, even if it goes from 500 to 800, like it did back you know, in 2008, or, or whatever, it's because people see the potential. They say, okay, all of a sudden, those projects that were not potentially not viable or not economical at that price now become more attractive at the new price. And I think that's what I've seen as the mostly what happens, you know, with the various cycles when it moves. And, that, you know, as a junior exploration company, that, I mean, that's what we look for. I'm sure that's what most junior exploration companies look for something that's got perhaps it's got historic resources that you know that were not that were not profitable at you know in our case in in 1992 at 400 or 500 dollar gold but become a lot more attractive when gold is 1500 or or 1700 and you know and then gives gives a boost to the exploration business because there's you know there's a there's a number of those projects that are out there that can be can be financed and can be explored. And out of that will come discoveries. That's what always happens. You get new discoveries. And, you know, and through my years, I've seen some some things where people, you know, where people have said, listen, there's nothing there. And somebody has gone and said, well, we found something here. And and that I think is, the, that's the thing. So I think what it does, it allows, it allows uh, people to, to think about different areas, different places. And, and that's when I've always seen the cycles happen. I think a lot of people miss the. I think a lot of people don't understand the actual work that's involved in making a, a discovery, especially of a large, uh, you know, a large gold deposit. We'll, we'll call them a tier one gold deposit that's, you know, over ten million ounces. And and we've got to find the industry right now today has to find twelve to fifteen of those tier one discoveries every year just to replace production from, yes. you know, like reserves are declining. The average grade of deposits is declining. Uh, but the cost of gold is going up. So all of those fundamentals sort of play into it and, and it just becomes this this flywheel of, of momentum. Like you've got a rising gold price, you start to get more investment into the junior sector to allow juniors to go out and do their jobs, which is to drill holes in the ground and find gold, to re, you know, develop gold reserves for uh, 
the food they feeding, I guess, is a, is a good way to put it. And, you know, it just it just builds that momentum and it keeps going. And it's it's like, man, the good times are the great times. I'll, I've, I've been through three or four of them myself, uh, similar to Jim. And uh, we've seen uh, work for a number of companies that have done quite well and made some major discoveries. And, and that's the upside in this business. And, and you're seeing opportunities out there that are coming to the forefront because of changes in technological methods of exploration. You're starting to see everybody's talking now about uh, chat GPT and, and artificial intelligence. You're starting to see that being deployed across the industry to, to, to look at established gold camps that have been deemed to be past their prime. And, and you're starting to see new discoveries and, and new exploration concepts and new opportunities in camps that have previously been ignored or forgotten or you know replaced by someplace else in the world that's uh, that's slightly better and and one of those areas is canada and i think investment in canada you're going to see a great deal of uh, uh, new investment in canadian gold properties going forward because let's face it the best place to look for gold is where there's gold so so discovery drives the value creation in this business and that's largely how these, as you mentioned earlier, some of these investments can return pretty spectacular results, whether it's 10x or 20x. Here on the panel, we have folks that have, in some cases, made discoveries, whether it's in the Yukon or in Mongolia or in Ontario or Alaska, or otherwise are searching and preparing to make a discovery. And hopefully, fingers crossed, hopefully they succeed. The question that I have for each of our panelists is, what are you most excited for this year in your particular pipeline of discovery or production or value creation more broadly? I'll jump in. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, for us, uh, we'll be in production this time next year or close, close to it next year. Um, so, you know, that, that generates cash flow that allows us to, uh, to finance our, our advancing our projects without dilution for the shareholders. Um, so our next our next project that we own 100% of is Lucky Shot, uh, high grade underground mine, historic production of uh, 40 grams per ton. That was I'm sure that was selectively mined and, and selectively processed. Uh, but it's a it's a high grade underground vein. This year we or last year we put in the infrastructure to be able to get underground and explore it. Uh, this year we'll we'll continue our exploration effort to define uh, more high grade uh, underground resources. Um, we know we've got a big under underutilized mill at Fort Knox, uh, so we see the opportunity to do the same thing that we've done with our Montreux project in in, in a joint venture with Kinross in sending ore from Lucky Shot up to the to the Fort Knox mill, and again, sort of uh, jumping leapfrogging that valley of death that the Lausanne curve talks about when you make your discovery and then you try to get into production. You go through feasibility and and permitting which can take two, three, four, five years, depending on jurisdiction. If we can, again, leapfrog that valley and get into production quickly by just sending our up to the Fort Knox mill, a mill that's been operating for 25 years, that's how we think we can very rapidly increase uh, value for our shareholders. And uh, so we're that's the kind of model that we're working with. Uh, we know that mill at Fort Knox is there, and we're just going to keep looking for opportunities where we can help them feed it. I'll go next. I guess what we're most, uh, most excited about I guess, this year is continue to advance um, our phase two expansion. We've already started construction last year and built the, the fixed pressing circuit, so that's already installed, and continue to chip away at that expansion while having stable, profitable production, which we have. Uh, we've built a great inventory of unprocessed ore on the pads today or on the ROM pad. We have uh, reagent inventory for six months. Uh, sitting on site today, so we had no supply chain issues that we dealt with in 2021, um, and really, you know, continuing to get that scale, um, uh, I guess, growing our, our production profile over time. Our goal is to be a 200,000 plus ounce producer in a few years. So, showing the path through expiration, continued delineation of our current uh, deposits, and maybe some some other opportunities to roll in and go build another heap leach in another another region. Um, that has sulfides below it as well and, and continue to grow that way. That's cool. Well, I'll jump in next. So 
what, what's really exciting about White Gold is it's basically like four or five different junior companies in one with the size of the land package that we have. And based on the work that we've sort of done to, to date, you know, we, we got to the top of our list a couple of very highly prospective uh, targets. And one of them we had a major discovery on uh, last year, which is called our Betty property. And I think as Wes said, uh, you know, the best place to find a mine or gold is where you know there's uh, other occurrences of gold. And so this property sits right along the same fault structure that hosts uh, Newmont's multi-million ounce uh, deposit. Uh, it was our team that made that original discovery. So based on what we're seeing, ultra high grade gold from surface, you know, our very first diamond drill hole in there was 50 meters of three and a half grams. Uh, it's in the shadows of the Western Coppers Casino, which is like 20 million ounces of gold and several billion pounds of copper. So this is like true elephant country. And so for us to be putting the first drill holes in there ever, it's, it's just you know, exciting, exciting, exciting stuff. And uh, you know, what we've seen so far is just, you know, pretty incredible. Uh, and that's just like a small part of our, uh, our our overall package, right? So we have all these lottery tickets, you know, up by our existing deposit, we made a brand new discovery there called the Ryan Surprise. We think that's going to continue to increase uh, the size of our, you know, our flagship deposit. Uh, so we have this great balance of, you know, ore in the ground, new discoveries, a couple other targets on deck this year that have never been drilled. Uh, and there's just so much happy in this district, which is also what really excites me. You know, you need to have that macro uh, momentum behind you. Newmont's got their um, approval to move forward with their permitting. Obviously, you have the, you know, the largest gold company in the world in your backyard. Rio is invested in Western Copper. We have Agnico and Kinross. Um, Hecla just bought, bought out a company in our district. So, you know, the majors, you know, these guys are, you know, do their, you know, do their homework right before they move in. So to see that all coming together, and it really just feels like we're at the prep precipice of this district really sort of going from being perspective to, you know, in production. And, and, and you know, there's a, a webinar out there, I think Michael Gray did it at the VRIC, that you know, he views this district being like the old it was 10 years ago. So that's, you know, an exciting time to be doing the kind of work we're doing. And, you know, time is everything in a lot of businesses, especially this one. So. We really feel like everything's kind of coming together at the perfect time right now. Well, uh, from my perspective, the best thing about this business in the last 40 years has been looking at what comes out of the drill bit. Uh, that's always the most exciting time when you uh, when you initiate a drilling program. And at, at uh, Tower Mountain, I think we have a real opportunity here to, to identify a uh, a new style of mineralization in the Archean Greenstone Belt. So it's a, uh, as I noted earlier, it's a magmatic hydrothermal system. So it's a large tonnage, low grade opportunity. I mean, there's a few successful examples in Canada out there, specifically Detour Lake, and not, not that they're magmatic hydrothermal, but just large tonnage, low grade opportunities that, uh, you know, they lack some of the drama and some of the challenges that higher grade uh, districts often bring into the equation. So that's our focal point is to use our drill bit and, and try to deploy our capital as efficiently as possible. We are extremely fortunate that we're located immediately beside a highway. We have year round access. We're a half hour from Thunder Bay. By the time I get to the work site in the morning, my coffee isn't even cold. Uh, and I just walk in the core shack and start, can start looking at core. And uh, that's, that's, that's a significant advantage to have. We're also lacking any any significant water courses that we're impacting with our development. We're not really reliant on any government largesse to, to allow us to proceed with developing the project. So I see Tower Mountain. I mean, the bitter reality is uh, 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 since I have been around since the Nixon years, I was kind of sliding towards retirement and a, and a nice, uh, quiet kind of lifestyle. And, and this opportunity came along and I thought it was just too good an opportunity to pass up. So I... Uh, I uh, dusted off my uh, my geological tools and, and dove in with uh, with both feet, and, and we're going to see where it takes us. And I think it's going to be a really exciting ride at exactly the right time. Yeah, I, I'll just uh, continue what Wes is talking about. The most exciting thing about exploration is drilling, of course. And, you know, I'm really excited about both of our, our proud gold projects. The project we have in Kirkland Lake is Malba, as I said. It's a high-grade uh, you know, Abitibi type gold mineralization veins with visible gold. But pretty exciting is we also discovered a brand new style of gold mineralization there with our drilling that's never been followed up. And we're very excited about that because Melba's kind of a unique situation. It's a small 
area of exposed rock where the four veins are, it's totally surrounded by swamp. And it's really never been explored away from the outcropping areas where the gold veins are. And the new exciting uh, discovery that we found is actually in the swamp. So no prospector has ever looked at it. No one's ever sampled it. This is the first time it's ever been actually been drilled. And the second one we're excited about is, as I said, the, the Hemlo model in the Batchewana Greenstone Belt. You have to understand about the Batchewana Greenstone Belt. It really hasn't been explored at all. And we have this beautiful discovery there, which was discovered by, as I said, one of the guys that discovered Hemlo. And, you know, got he sort of got shut down by the bad price of gold. But we have four high-grade gold intersections on that property, including an intersection of, you know, 15 grams in a, in a, in a section that's nine meters wide of, say, one or two grams. So it has the potential to have some tremendous, uh, some tremendous intersections. And we're looking forward to and very excited about starting to drill on that project this summer and follow up some of the high grade zones that, that are known there and, uh, and, you know, and, and continue to explore these high grade intersections. So like Wes said, the most, the most, what you get most excited about is what's coming out of the drill. And that's what I'm pretty excited about right now. Very cool. On the theme of what's coming out of the drill, James Radner has submitted a question where he's described that he's seen some gold stories that took off when they started exploring additionally for battery metals, lithium, nickel, etc. Will any of you consider that move this year? Uh, no, we're uh, precious metals focused. We do have base metals component to our sulfide expansion. So there is some exposure to base metals. Uh, lead and zinc, but um, in this vehicle, uh, our, our primary focus is precious metals. I would say it's the same for us, even though we do have a copper project where we where we did some drilling last year and got some high-grade copper intersections. I would say because we're focusing on gold, that's a project we'll be looking for a partner more than expanding our, our own work there. We spent about a million dollars there last, last year, discovered a very nice a massive sulfide deposit with, as I said, high-grade copper, sometimes a little bit of gold and some zinc. So as far as critical metals, I would say, yeah, we have a little bit of that. But, you know, I agree with the Neil. We're, we're going to be a, a gold company. That's what we're going to focus on. Yeah, same for us. Uh, you know, we, we've spent north of $100 million, you know, defining our assets and getting these targets drill ready. So that, that's our focus. Now, with that said, this... You know, it's such a big land package, and Yukon's so minerally diverse and rich. There's a certainly a probability we come across something. You know, we have a couple of properties with uh, uh, copper porphyry signatures, kind of similar to the casino, our neighbor. Um, if something comes out of that, you know, it, you know, we're, we're going to do the work. We've done the soils, et cetera. Then that's worth a conversation. Would it be a focus? Maybe that's uh, a sidecar, or there's some other opportunity. But uh, you know, our team, you know, we're gold experts. We have two of the best uh, gold companies in the world as our uh, shareholders. So that's it. We're intent on focus, continue to focus there. No, I hate to be a broken record, but it would be the same for Contango. We, uh, we're, we do have um, some interesting copper assets uh, in the portfolio, but uh, I think like David will probably uh, end up doing something at a you know, the sidecar uh, arrangement with those. Yeah, and the same for Thunder Gold. I mean, we're, we're extremely fortunate in the fact that Tower Mountain, it's gold. There, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, there's really no other economic metals of interest associated with that particular deposit, which, again, is uh, uh, indicative of its uh, unique nature and, and uh, the way that the deposit forms. So, you know, it's, uh, it would, it, I won't lie, it would, been, it would have been nice to have some low-grade copper associated with the deposit. Just makes things a little easier in some respects. But this is a gold play, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna continue to explore it as such. Absolutely, building on the theme of gold and the gold outlook for 2023, Doctor Eno Ivar asks: In recent weeks, a few countries, especially the emerging markets have started adopting the gold standard to back their currencies. What is the view of the panel in terms of its effect on the gold market? And can the new demand push prices even higher? Hmm. 
Yeah, I guess um, I mean buying buying will <laughs> that's that creates creates more buying, right? So obviously it's going to have an impact. I mean, I think I think the biggest push was going to be the generalists <clears throat> as they come into the market, increasing you know to one or two percent of their portfolio would have a massive a massive uh, demand um, for gold. But now you have central banks buying all of them in, in obviously in that region uh, are buying more, uh, so that's increasing demand. So you're going to have a double whammy, I think, between. Uh, general inv investors and central banks that will increase uh, demand significantly in these in these coming uh, years. Uh, that's my belief. So I don't, whether they all adopt the actual gold standard or just backing their the currencies with as much as gold as they can. I mean that's what Mongolia was doing before COVID, but they were forced to have to sell down some reserves because their exports were uh, were, were down significantly because of zero COVID policy with China. But um, certainly, I think as things get better, improve, you'll see. Smaller countries like that uh, continue to build up their gold reserves. And what's unique now? It's a lot easier to buy physical gold than it has been ever before. Before you just have to go, you know, walk to an outlet, buy a physical gold. You got to store it at home in a safe or whatever it is. But now there's you know, a number of uh, you know online outlets you can do. I think every, at least in Canada, every bank has you know just log in through your online banking. You can buy physical gold, right? They store it for you and everything else. So that. The, what, that that's that accessibility is going to be very interesting, uh, you know. Once this uh, new uh, generalist investor starts to take interest in, in the sector as well, so that, that's something that's been different before. And then the one other thing, you know, we're talking about demand, demand, demand. I think someone brought up before the supply. There's been a huge underinvestment in exploration in the last decade, at least. So you know, it's economics 101, supply and demand. There's, looks like there's going to be an increase in demand. There's going to be less supply. So what's that going to do with the price, right? There's a lot of sort of factors that are really sort of coming into play here that I think are setting up uh, the market quite nicely for a major re-rating in gold. And you know, like we discussed, I think the equities go along with that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the the, uh, the grades, the average grade of what's being mined today is uh, a lot lower than it was 10, 20 years ago. And, and that trend isn't going to change. I mean, you're seeing the big gold miners basically having to start becoming copper miners so that they can also mine gold in these big copper gold porphyries. Uh, they're very low grade copper and they're very low grade gold deposits, but they're big. And so they require huge amounts of capital. That's on the, on the, uh, on the supply side, on the, on the, uh, on the other, other side, you, you know, the central banks buying uh, and key among those is Russia. We've, you know, sanctioned Russia with the, as a result of the Ukraine war, uh, that's not going away anytime soon. Hopefully it doesn't go nuclear, but um, that that central bank, that's forced uh, Russia to buy uh, gold um, along with China and, uh, and India and Turkey and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. Those countries are all collaborating to do something different than rely on the U.S. dollar, and that's that's also a long-term trend. That's not going away anytime soon either. So I think both those are uh, that that supply imbalance and the the demand that's uh, sort of a backdrop. Uh, it's not necessarily always front page news, but it's it's going it's ongoing and it will continue to go for for a long time. And I'll just, I mean, Rick, Rick said it very well. It's a, it's a different world that we're living in right now, for sure. And, and there are certainly geopolitical factors that come into play. But, uh, uh, you know, I think that buying pressure with the central banks uh, from the countries that he noted is going to continue in the future. And, and uh, you know, that's a backlash against the, I think somebody said it earlier, the hegemony of the U.S. dollar. Uh, it's just people trying to get away from, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the current the current status of the world financial markets central banks and institutional investors are significant allocators of capital and so they seem to be voting with their dollars that a gold bull market is coming and so the question that i have for you is how does each of your companies fit into the portfolio of either a retail investor or an institutional investor, and how should they think about the job that owning your particular equity does for that portfolio? I guess I'll start there. Um, 
I mean, listen, we're, we're a producer, so I guess um, we've, we've, we've shown execution from building a, mile, uh, a mine and, and bringing it online successfully. Uh, we're very local uh, where, where we do our business. So there's, I think, from a risk mitigation perspective, we're, 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 we're lower risk because um, <clears throat> we're established now. We're employing 300 um, local employees. We pay taxes. We pay royalties. Um, yet we still offer all what I would say is the upside that an explorer or our, our peers here on, on, on this panel uh, offered and can still be a potential 510x as a producer. There's not many producers that can can, can be a 510x in, in the next few years. And that's our belief of what our valuation should be. A 100,000 ounce producer with a thousand dollar margin is, you know, back of the envelope getting there, right? Uh, and then we still have expiration sizzle and, and opportunity ahead of that. Uh, and last but not least is our alignment with our shareholders. Um, we own 20% of the company. We've been public for over four and a half years, have never sold a share. Um, and we are always mindful of dilution. So we feel the pain in this in this uh, undervalued market, but we always do what we can to mitigate dilution. So there's the very strong al alignment with our investors. And I think that's very important too. Yeah, I'll just follow on with uh, uh, Neil. And, and I think much the same that uh, an investor in Contango is investing in a company that uh, is on a, you know, within a year we'll be in production and we'll be generating cash flow and we'll be able to continue our uh, our exploration efforts, which we've been successful at. And uh, but we'll be doing that without dilution to shareholders. And I think that's a that's a key thing for uh, a shareholder looking at uh, looking at any opportunity is uh, is, you know, what's what's the pre what's the prospect of dilution? And it's not that you can't invest in companies that are going to need more capital that's that that certainly is the that's the name of the game in the exploration business and that's where the 10x and 20x can come from but there's also this slow and steady you you're producing you're you're uh, you've got time to be able to do your analysis and, and decide what your next step is and for us it's lucky shot uh, but we'll we'll uh, we have a very low short uh, share count we've been very uh, very stingy with our shares uh, so, you know, it's not to say we wouldn't look at an acquisition opportunity. As we talked about earlier, most of the juniors are trading at big discounts to their NAVs. And uh, so there may be opportunity in the M&A space for us. I can jump in here. Like I mentioned earlier, White Gold is, you know, quite unique from a junior exploration perspective in that we do have a very significant uh, a deposit, uh, you know, we're about 1.8 million ounces now across sort of all categories. We've done a bit of work, we're putting out an upgrade sometime later, an update sometime later this year. Uh, you know, to have an asset that size at a tier one jurisdiction at the grades we do, those are sort of few and far between. Uh, so we're really happy to have that. Um, unfortunately, as a, our market cap, we trade at, you know, a, a significant discount to our peers, so maybe an opportunity for, for new people. But at the same time, we have this very exciting uh, new discovery potential like we see with our Betty property and a number of other uh, properties like that. So you sort of get the, the best of both worlds. And we're fortunate for a junior company to have institutional analyst coverage. I think the last target that I saw was about 245. You know, we trade at uh, around 35 cents these days. So, you know, there, there's clearly a disconnect. You know, we've talked about a lot of reasons why, but, you know, to have somebody out there sort of saying that other than myself, I think that gives, uh, should give people a lot of comfort in, you know, at least the, the approach that we've been taking. And uh, hopefully when the market sort of does start to come uh, back a little bit, we'll see that re-rating quite quickly. As a quick follow-on, David, just uh, a question from Greg Charlton. What is the plan for White Gold? Do you plan to develop a mine, or is the intent for one of your major shareholders to roll White Gold into their portfolio? What We're an exploration company. That's our skill set. So, you know, corporately, it's on our agenda, right? This asset is now ready to go to the next level. What's it going to look like? Like I mentioned before, we have two of the you know, best mining companies in the world, the shareholders, they got a seat at the table. So, you know, there's other parties that have been showed interest, right? So, depending on whatever is the best fit, and most importantly, whatever makes the most sense for shareholders, of which you know we're the largest shareholder group being managed at insiders. That's what we're going to look to pursue. Um, you know, it's great to be in an environment where there is so much interest, and you know, I think that all just speaks to you know the quality of the deposit, uh, where it is. Right, we talked about geopolitical risk a little bit. That's always an issue. I think when you're investing in mining, uh, it's you know clearly never been more so an issue than it is today. And 
you know, people have the opportunity to step into positions where, you know, our, you know, our company, I don't think it's ever been more valuable. I don't think that prospectivity has ever been greater. Yeah, we're trading at a 52 week low, like 90% of the other junior uh, companies out there. So it's, it's a very interesting time to be um, involved in, in, in the industry. It's, but from terms of, you know, new people coming into the market, uh, you know, I think the setup is great. And it's nice to see, like we discussed before, that, uh, you know, it's there is interest building and success is being rewarded in the market, right? You know, there, there are times where companies have phenomenal drill holes and, you know, they go unrecognized. But we've seen in the last year or so companies, you know, have, you know, tremendous recognition of their work, like, say, a Philo Mining that's, you know, done tremendous work in South America. Um, uh, Collective Mining is another company I'm uh, very close with. They've had some exceptional drill results. And the markets reward at a very significant uh, equity price and appreciation. So, so you know, I think I think the momentum is there. We're at the early days, but you know, it's very uh, comforting to sort of see that you know, everything everyone sort of thought would be happening is starting to happen. And you know, whatever that next major catalyst is going to be, it's going to happen, and you know, things likely will start to uh, compound quickly from there. Very cool. And last, Jim, uh, over to you in terms of how investors should be thinking about owning shares potentially and what role that plays in their portfolio. Well, I mean, uh, Thunder Gold is kind of a, a, a great value opportunity because of the fact that you're, you're acquiring a position in our company at essentially founders prices. And, and we have a, an asset with a potentially significant size potential that we can explore quickly and efficiently at, at a very low cost. So, I mean, where we sit on the on the Lausanne curve of things is totally different than where uh, some of the other guys have noted that they sit and, and you know, they're, they're moving towards development and production and, and high capital. You know, there's a lot of capital involved in that. We're actually at the at the lower end of the curve. There's, you know, exploration companies, I'll be honest, still have no problem spending money, but the amount of money that they have to raise is significantly reduced than a company that's trying to, to develop a mine and bring it forward to commercial production. So. You know, we've got lots of upside on, uh, I think, on the share price and, and lots of uh, opportunity and speaking through the drill bit. And my plan is basically to tell people what I plan to do on a regular basis and then go out and do it. It's really that simple. And Jim, over to you. You're on me, by the way, just as a heads up. Oh, sorry, Jim, you're still on mute. You go ahead, you want to talk. Yeah, you're good. Well, I'm just going to say that's the way that's the way it is with exploration. You get in at a low point where we all, where most junior mining exploration companies are, and you just wait for them to to do the good work that they can. And you know, as as David was saying, good good results are getting rewarded, and we're expecting good results because we have two projects with high grade gold, uh, one of which has a, a historical resource. So, you know, we're expecting good results from our Exploration program once it starts, and uh, and then just and that's really where I think is the opportunity, you know, get in at at founders' prices exactly what Wes said, and then and then ride uh, ride the success from there. Very cool. So, folks, we're at the end of time, and so I'm going to invite each of our panelists to make a prediction ten years from now about where they think the price of gold will be. Higher. <laughs> that would be a consensus opinion, I think. <laughs> Actual price, though, I'm I, I'm not in the forecasting business. Give me five thousand, give me ten thousand, it'll be higher. I can all go on record to say that much. <laughs> I'll, I'll agree with Anil. I, I think it's really going to depend on how much more money money printing there's going to be, and uh, you know, if we're heading into a, a recession. And if it's a, a global recession and that lasts uh, a year, that'll re that'll be a reset. I think gold will do well in that environment in that it at least will hold its value. And if the, if the solution to a recession is to print more money, which has been what they've been doing, then gold will perform extremely well. So um, I'm, I'm bullish for gold and uh, that's why we're gonna stay focused on gold. Absolutely. I'll just go with uh, slow and steady growth in the in the price of gold. I mean, over the last uh, 20, 25 years, it's what the uh, annual annual uh, appreciation in the gold price of somewhere in the range of 10% annually, and, and I think that march is just going to continue. 
if I was a gambling man and and I uh, was putting my chips on the table, I'd, I'd go for around uh, somewhere around uh, three thousand dollar gold in, uh, in ten years time, and and uh, that's what we're putting all our chips towards with uh, with uh, Thunder Gold. Right. Yeah. I'm with these guys. I think we're going to be higher, a lot higher, and you know. I'm not an economist, but you know, so even some of the most bearish economists that I follow feel like there's going to be a significant uptick in the price of gold here uh, as soon as the rates are signaled that they're going to either pause or start to come down, which you know, they think it's all cyclical and it's going to happen. So uh, it could be exciting. I don't know when that's going to be, three, six, nine months, a year, but uh, that, that, that could be a real catalyst uh, to get things moving here again. Well, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be shy. I'm going to say $17.42. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> Incredible. Well, thank you, folks. I appreciate all of the perspectives and ideas. And I'll give it to each of you if you want to make one closing remark before we close things off. I'm good. Thank you. Well, with that, then, unless anyone else wants to jump in. I, I just want to thank everybody for participating. I thought it was a very informative session, and it was uh, nice to nice to hear everybody speak and learn about their projects. And I wish you all uh, nothing but the greatest of success going forward. And uh, let's stay in touch. Yeah, thank you.